pick up where we left off last week. We started, again, the whole conversation of uh, the conversations with the mind divine, talking to God. We've been doing this for the last eight weeks now, two months almost. And we started a, a teaching last week on travailing, it's giving birth. And this, is, and this is like really part two of that. I didn't finish all of it. There's so much to it. We left off actually with Isaiah 53. And uh, the great example of the one who travailed, of course, is Jesus. And I would say that in all of our, our, our life, if you're looking for an example of a holy life, the, the, the epistles of Peter tell, so this, uh, says this, Jesus is our example of a holy life. So if you want the example of a teacher, of a pastor, of an apostle, of one who shows love and shows kindness and a shepherd, um, it's Jesus. And also as an intercessor. So if we go where we left off last week, I mean, go to Isaiah 53 and um, verses 7 through 11. This is, a, this is the, the verse that we, we ended last week. And I'll just read it as you're turning towards it. Um, it just says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for this generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. And again, this all talks about Jesus. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the, Lord, it was the will of the Lord to crush him and to put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, and again, is the intercession. He shall, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul shall he, set, shall he see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities." awesome example of Jesus. And this is fulfilled, if you want to see this in the New Testament fulfilled, John chapter 17. I won't go through that, but you can write that in your notes. Um, that's, that's Christ travailing in the Garden of Gethsemane with I mean, incredible pain. He travailed, praying for himself to sanctify himself. Lord, restore to me the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world. Then he prayed for the, the 11 that were with him from the beginning. Of course, there's 12, but this is minus Judas now. He's praying for, the, for those who take his word, travailing for them. Because he already said, you know, Satan has designed to sift you like wheat, Peter, and all the disciples. And he prayed for them. And then he also, the last third of that chapter of John 17, he prays for those that will come after them through their word, his word through them, which implies us. His intercession towards us. Because Jesus travailed, verse 11, and suffered in his soul uh, in a toilsome labor, he brought forth what he labored for. And that's travailing. We have to keep pressing in. If it, if it means a lot to you and your soul, friends, don't give up in prayer. I'm going to show with the scripture verses. This is just from last week. Travailing is asking. Travailing is pain. We, we talked about that before. It's, it's giving birth. And, and, and every, every mother here knows that. You give birth. There's this pain in travailing, but you're giving birth. Same principle in prayer. We saw that last week in Galatians, and Paul, as with his pastoral heart, saying, "Even now, I'm in travail. I'm travailing over you. That you know, for 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 that, that for you to hang on to Christ, for, for for more to be saved. Basically, is what he's saying. And because he travailed, he brought forth many souls." For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy that's set before every mother as she begins her labor pains, she knows a child is coming. She endures the pain. But the same principles in prayer, friends, in our lives. There's an anguish. We see our communities. We see our families. We see uh, injustice, maybe even around the world, but something stirs in us. And we begin to get a burden and begin to pray. And we hold on. And yeah, it's painful, but you hold on. 
Here's some other examples. I mean, go over to um, Isaiah 26. Can you see that okay? Isaiah 26. I mean, if I go to Isaiah now, just go about maybe 10 pages to your left. Isaiah 26. And this is what I'm talking about, the, 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 the need not to give up. Isaiah 26, 16. 16 through 19. O Lord, in distress they sought you. They poured out a whispered prayer when your discipline was upon them. In other words, when it was time, when, when, they, when they knew we had to do this. Was, and prayer is, is a discipline. Like a pregnant woman who withers and cries out in her pangs when she is near giving birth, so will we because of you, O Lord. We were pregnant, we withered, but we have given birth to wind. We have accomplished no deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not fallen. There's a giving up in prayer. And I say this in a way to shock, but also in a way to remember. Spiritual abortion is, in fact, quitting in prayer. When God has given you uh, a word, giving you a people, giving you something in your heart, a burden in your heart, and you're praying, and you give up. God longs to give birth through our praying. Giving up in prayer is giving up, delivering the child, and stopping the birth. It's seeing the vision at first, believing in it, pressing in with it, and then after a while just giving up on it. It's like a mother who gives up on her child, like a father who gives up on his family. Life, in spiritual life in this sense, prayer will cost us, travailing costs us. See, obviously we talk about this towards the end of this season, this, this, not season, this, these, these sessions of prayer, because everything we learned before that is leading up to this point. Knowing how to pray, we learned uh, how Jesus taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, we knew, understand these, these principles. Do as I say and not as I do. Turn off your phones. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, where were we? Okay. In the, in the height of the moment, okay. Uh, but anyway, so the giving up in prayer is, is giving up in a sense. I mean, get this picture, again, of, of Paul. I say, even now I'm in labor for you, praying, interceding for the Galatian church. Now imagine if you just gave up. Well, it's never going to happen. I think I gave a testimony last week, did I not? How somebody who was praying for me finally said, you might just stop praying for this guy. Well, in his mind, he, he, he gave up. Others didn't. They kept laboring in. And the church is guilty of, I believe, a spiritual abortion in the sense where I use that as a part of, again, I use that term in the, in the sense of praying and giving up. When we give up praying for the lost, we give up the child, as it were, when we stop praying. Maybe it's the one that you see in the street all the time and, and, you, just, and you just begin to pray for. Could be a stranger, somebody on your workplace. And, and there's a sense that you had once that, oh, this guy really needs Jesus. And maybe you prayed for a while and now you don't even think of him anymore. I would encourage you, friends, that if God has given you a word, stay with it. God is faithful. God is faithful. And it will cost us. It certainly will. And here we are, a people who were ready to give birth and withered and brought forth wind. I pray for revival deeply in the church here in England. I don't mean the church of England. I mean the church in England. I mean all believers. I mean a deep spiritual revival. I mean, look at, I mean, if you know some of church history, guys like John Knox. Give me Scotland or I die. Even Queen Mary says she fears John Knox more than the, all the armies of France. When she was a Catholic and, and Knox was, you know, he was a, a Calvinist, he was a Protestant, he was praying. She feared his prayers more than the armies of France because he wouldn't give up. 
Wesley, bringing revival through this land. What a man of prayer. Would not give up. And we learn these lessons already. Jacob, I will not let go until you bless me. Jesus, all night long in the garden. He's our example. Of course, he did it for the souls of the world. We may do it for the souls of our family. Not that we die for them, but praying for them. Our children, our church, our neighborhood. And so we have to keep pressing in and not, don't give up on the child. If God's giving you that word, stay with it. Um, we have, go to Romans chapter 10. And go to the New Testament. Romans chapter 10. Uh, this is Paul's teaching, of course, to the church in Rome. Rome cha uh, Romans chapter 10. Very famous passage, used a lot in evangelism. But we're talking about giving birth to souls here, or giving birth to the, the burden that God's put upon our heart. Romans 10, 17. Simply says, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So faith comes by hearing the word of God, listening to what he is saying. Most of the time, we understand from the word of God. Many times God may put something in our heart, an impression, a picture, or hear it from somebody else. Being a pastor, being a chaplain, I, hear, I, I get asked all the time, please pray for my husband. Please pray for the, pray, you know, God has given me a way. And many times it's through other people. God, God puts a burden for somebody I may not even know on my heart. As I said last week, my own testimony, a chaplain prayed for me for two years. I didn't even know who this guy, Kurt Erickson, was. And suddenly his name, his voice is on her answering machine. But so, because somebody said to her, please pray for this guy. But that's hearing the voice of God. So it's through the word of God, through the body of Christ we hear the word of God, and maybe just something from within or without. You know, if God has given you a word or a promise, don't fall back in unbelief. You know, I won't go to another. Psalm 78 talks about Ephraim turned back in the day of battle. Don't be like Ephraim. Ephraim means doubly blessed. Ephraim was, he was well armed for the battle. If you read, go through Psalm 78, and he turned back. And the Lord was displeased. We are well, well armed for the battle, friends. With the Holy Spirit abiding within us, with the word of God in our hand, with the full armor of God upon us, we, we, are, we should be ready for the battle. If God has given you the word or the promise, Hang on to it. Hang on to it. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Again, in relation to this, he'll come and steal that promise God's given you. That, that I shall be saved in my household. Uh, Hudson Taylor would say, you know, uh, give me China. John Knox, give me Scotland. Give me my family, Lord. My sons, my daughters. And don't fall back in unbelief. Don't be like Ephraim, who's doubly blessed and full-armed, but when the day of the battle came, he ran. He turned around. Travailing is based on faith. It's a walk in the Spirit. I may not see it now, but I'll pray until I see what God's put on my heart, the salvation of the soul, a changing of the spiritual contour in my job. You know, I used to, I worked as one job and I worked as a waiter and um, for many years, I was, after I was a Christian still, and I used to work in these really fast places. Like, uh, there's one place I worked at, a restaurant, it was like across the street with five Broadway theaters. And you ever go to the West End before a theater? You know, these, these restaurants are nuts. Get them in, get them out. People want to, you know, they come at seven o'clock with a, a three course meal and be out by 10 to 8 so they can see this show. The maitre d' flipping out at you, the chef is flipping out at you. Get these in, get them in, get them out. And he just absolutely flipped out. And two stories on this one, I had one maitre d' that was just, he was just a Doberman. I just, he just, I was just a dog barking at you all the time. I just said, God, get me out of here or get him saved. <laughs> because I, it's, it, this guy is such a grief to my spirit. I came to my work, he's just barking. You know, rah, rah. And finally I did. And within two weeks later, I ended up getting another job, another restaurant. I was right near there. And I just, I said, this guy's just a grief. 
You know, I said, you know, but change the situation, God. Either change me or change the situation. And I pressed in. Other times, in the same place, I'd get so worked up, I'd just go, again, I'd go into the loos, or the single loos, shut the door, and just pray. Just for like a minute. Say, God, give me the peace. Just give, God, restore the peace in my mind. Again, that's since travailing for myself, interceding for myself at the time. God, I just want your peace. And open up, and then I can, my mind was, and I could just do the work I had to do. But as far as, you know, it's based on faith, and so walk in the Spirit. If God's given you that, that, that vision, friends, stick with it. Don't give up. Don't give up on that. Um, go over to Galatians chapter 3. Again, with, this is the original book that we saw before that Paul says that even now I'm in travail over you. Uh, I want to give birth to you and... The Galatians were going back. The Galatians were like the Ephraim. They were doubly blessed. They had the spirit. They had the word. Judaizers were coming in and bringing them back to living under the law. And Paul says, who has bewitched you? What, what are you doing? And look at uh, Galatians chapter 3. And this is, you know, this whole thing about law versus grace. That's what Galatians is all about. It's like the son of, son of Romans. Romans is a beautiful um, writing on the righteousness of God by grace. And uh, Galatians is, is written earlier than Romans, and Paul form, really formulates his thoughts in Romans, but he begins it here in Galatians a few, a few uh, like a decade before. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or hearing by faith? Let me ask you, did you receive the burden of intercession by the Spirit or by flesh? Did not God give you that burden for that person? And yes, and now you're, because your flesh is weary, you're giving up. No, you receive that revelation by, by the Holy Spirit to pray for that one. Again, as Abraham stood, in the, stood before the Lord in intercession, is stand in the gap. That's the work of the Lord. And you're facing God. He, he stood before the Lord and he began to intercede for Sodom. That wasn't the work of the flesh, man. That was the Spirit prompting Abraham to wrestle with God. Say, God, would you do this? Friends, you have that authority. Stand before the Lord. God, would you do this, God? Would, would you save this one? Would you change this one, God? Would you stand before it? Continue as you started, friends, in the Spirit. Stay in the Spirit. You know, I'm not talking about some hyper-spirituality type of thing. I'm talking about a walk in the faith, which is available to all of us. Same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that prompted Knox to, to stand before even the Queen and demand Scotland for the Lord. Not in the political terms. He's talking spiritually. Give me Scotland or I die. He meant revival. Same Holy Spirit lives in you. I pray for my, my neighborhood, Lord. My workplace, my family. I will not let the devil chew up my son, chew up my daughter. Lord, I stand in the gap for them right now. And that's the work of the Spirit, friends. As Paul was standing in the gap for the Galatians, as Abraham stood in the gap for Sodom at that time. Lord, if this is just 10, would you destroy the city? The boldness. And Jesus stood in the gap in Gethsemane. I'm praying for the Lord. Satan has a desire to sift them like wheat. I'm standing here, Lord. I'm praying for them. Oh, there's no, there's, there's very few higher callings, friends, and it's available to everyone. So you realize intercession is not a gift of the Spirit, friends. It's not a fruit of the Spirit. It's a reality of the burden of the Lord upon those who believe in Him who want to see their, their surroundings changed. They want to see birth. I want to see newness, freshness, life.
Check out Ephesians 5. Paul again, talking to Ephesians, chapter 5. Chapter 5. What, just one word here, and it just really hit me. <laughs> I say this to myself, and I, I encourage you as well. Ephesians 5, verse 10, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Another way of putting it, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. What is it, God, that you want me to say? See, God informs us or impresses upon us times and seasons of intercession, of weeping, wailing, and travailing. To weep for the lost. When was the last time we've had prayer meetings in the church? And I'm not talking about any particular church, I'm just talking about the church that we've been weeping for the lost, crying out for them. But for the grace of God, Lord, so go I. That's the ones I'm praying for. You know, I've worked with some precious souls and going out in the streets many times and some people come up for the first time second time, third time, maybe a month or so, and they see firsthand God moving on those who have, as far as the world standards goes, so, so little and so really down and out. And they go back to their houses and their homes and they are, they are, they're gutted. They're weeping. Weeping. And not because, just a moving of God. God's touched their heart. And they began to pray for those who, who don't have what we have. I'm just talking about that one instance, maybe just physical things. But, but about salvation. And I tell you, friends, and I speak to myself, all of us, but for the grace of God, so go I. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. For I pray for, as those who, and I said this last week, all of us are here today because somebody prayed for you to come into the kingdom of God. Every church that, we, that you go, that you see, someone had a vision to plant a church. Could have been two in this country, could have been 500 years ago. Somebody somewhere had a vision to plant a church. And we've entered into that vision when you join that church, when you come to that church. You've entered into that vision. Somewhere along the line. And there's times and seasons of a decession and... You know, and, and you know, there's weeping and wailing, but there's not so much joy and laughter because weeping may last the night, friends. But when you see that person, that situation change, what joy. Like again, the mother in travail, the pain and, of, of giving birth, and then you have the baby in your arm. Incredible. The most spiritual thing I've ever seen in my life, besides my own salvation as I look in the mirror, is being there when my wife gave birth to my two sons. Life giving birth to life. Incredible. And then you see this in the spirit where some of the hardest cases that you ever think in, in your own natural mind being broken by the spirit of God and coming into the, to the kingdom of God. And you're part of that. You prayed through the night for these people. You prayed, you've interceded. You stood in the gap. You stood before the Lord. and said, God, save this one. Save this one, Lord. And you're there. So I want to give some points to our friends. And again, I don't, I don't like doing this so much. I do, in a sense, like, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. But um, these things have worked for me. They may not work for you, but I'll just give out just some, again, a systematic teaching on, on travailing that, that, that may help you. So this is more practical stuff now in travailing. The more is the more like a, a theological or biblical overview, a very short overview of travailing. But here's maybe some, 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 some pointers that maybe help you to do it. And there's four points, and we have enough time even to talk about this maybe later on, or do this. Number one, we must have a clear vision, a clear goal. It's not just throwing prayers out left or right or, or, or whatever. Ask God how, what, where, when, who? I'll give an example. If people come out on, on, the, um, on the streets with us, and I guess, so some people have actually gone back to the homes and they've wept. But God's put upon their heart a, a, maybe a particular person, and you begin to pray for that particular person, for that particular situation. 
Um, how, God, how, how can I pray for this person? How can they come to know? How can they be changed? Who, what, where, when? We will know because you've asked God and expect God to answer. So as you begin to ask God that, I promise you, friends, he will tell you. Ask and you shall receive. It's to his glory that you know how to pray with, with your mind. We pray in the spirit, but we pray in our mind too. We pray with knowledge. So I just don't pray, oh God, just touch the homeless in London. I'll just use this as an example, as I, to follow through that one example. No, pray for that homeless man that I met whose name is whatever, Johnny, I'll just say. Uh, no, I know him now. I know the situation. Or pray for the government. I pray for what's going on. Be specific. How, God? We have an election coming up. God, how can I pray for this, this nation, for this person, for the situation? And we know because we ask and we expect. Intercession, as a matter of fact, when you're giving birth, you're not praying, oh God, just touch every mother in the world. No, God, touch me right now. And again, I'm speaking for every mother, I'm sure. But anyway, Lord, is this baby I'm talking about right now? Is this time? What God has put upon your heart, pinpoint it. And the more you pinpoint it, friends, the more, I, I believe, the more you're going to see the glory of God. Be specific in your brain. That one in your family, that one in the neighborhood, have a clear vision and precise goal. So your, your prayers aren't just all over the place. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, his main burden was, in fact, I'm going to the cross in about six hours. And in the trailing of his soul, He brought many to salvation. Give me the strength to go through this. Not my will, but yours be done, Lord. If you, if you can take this cup from me, not any cup, if you can take this cup from me, Lord. Lovely. But if you don't, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. So be very specific. Pinpoint. As much as you... As a matter of fact, is. You know, I, I don't mean rehearsing in the sense of making them trite, but rehearse your prayers over and over again. Say it again. And it, it, there's nothing wrong, friends. As a matter of fact, it's scriptural that you pray your prayers more than once. Jesus did. He prayed in Gethsemane. He went, his disciples were sleeping. Scripture says that he went back and prayed the same thing. Then he went back again. He saw them sleeping. Wake up. And he went back and prayed the same thing. Thing. You know that I used that acronym last week, push, pray until something happens. Pray through. Be specific. And the more specific you are, actually the more specific you are, the more serious God would take you. Because you're going to keep pressing in. It's not just any son, Lord, it's my son. It's not just any job, Lord, it's my job. It's my community, God. And again, Abraham had, had some, some other interests too. His, his family were in Sodom. So yes, he was praying for God, show mercy, but also my family is there, Lord. And he's very specific. Two. Have a vivid picture. Obtain a picture, a vision of where your prayers are headed. In other words, have that goal again. So you know exactly how, and then, then you can see the progress of it. Especially if you're praying for people. I, I love it when, you know, I, I, I've seen it over and over again. God breaking down years of resistance. Sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes, friends, in your, your feeling, it may not happen at all, but you have to believe, no, I, I see this person saved as I pray. I walk by faith and not by sight. 
As I said, my friend of many years ago walked by faith. He might just stop praying for this guy. He just saw the outside. And on the inside, it's like this vision of one time the Lord gave me years ago, and it's, it's, it's stuck with me. I think it's, it's, it's one of those visions that, you know, it's not for the moment, but it's, it's for your life. It's like the swimmer. Yeah, I'm not sure if you swim, but... And the, the vision was from the eyes of the swimmer who's pushing down, kicking his feet, pushing down, reaching up. He's underwater, but he sees the light through the water. He's not there yet, but he keeps pushing and is going to reach the top and come out of the water. But he sees the light. He's pushing down. He's kicking his feet. He's, he's, he's not, if he gives up, he drowns. But he just, he's pushing down, reaching up. The vision is to get to the top with his air with this water. And I see the light through the water. I see it vaguely, but it's there. And we may see a vision now, friends, through a glass darkling. We may not have the whole picture, but keep pushing down, reaching up. You'll break through that water. Have that vision, that, that, that seek after the goals for yourself. Keep that fire and the passion burning until it happens. And that's the key, friends. And I said it to myself, I said to all of us, you know, to keep the fire of God hot in our soul, it can be easily be quenched. Amen? Easily be compromised, even little things. Keep it hot. Be around people also who are praying. You know, one who walks with wise men becomes wise, Proverbs says. If you hang around people who are, are prayers, you, you learn their lingo. You learn their habits. Be around people who have that burden for the lost. You'll catch that fire, and soon you'll have a burden for the lost. No, that should be that. Know that God will give you the heart's desire when you continue to, to delight in him. Don't let this be a burden that crushes you. And, you know, go to some... 37 quickly on this. It's just so, it's a beautiful, it's a be I just, one of my, Psalm 37 is one of my life verses, or life psalms, uh, for many reasons and for many verses. But Psalm, four, uh, Psalm 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. What a beautiful promise. Delight in him. Yes, intercession is painful. I said it before, and, I, and now I'm taking the other aspect of it too. But there's much joy in that too. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desire of your heart. I just want to read that Proverbs 10, verse 24. What the wicked dreads, dread, uh, dreads will come upon him but the desire of the righteous will be granted. What a contrast. The ones who reject God, what they fear will come upon them. But those who walk righteously, friends, what you desire will be given to you. That's lovely. That's lovely. Know that God will give you your heart's desire. When you continue to, to delight yourself in him. And prayer should be a delight, friends. It is work. But in this sense, it is a delightful work. It's hard work. But like the farmer at the end of the day, even with calloused hands can, and a tired body can sit on his porch and look out and see a harvest in front of him. He did the work. Amen? Prayer is that. You do the work. You know, and you just see what God has done. Here's something I've mentioned before. Talking about intercession, but pray with assurance, friends. Don't pray apologetically. Pray with boldness. Be assured that God will speak while you're praying. And, and that's where, the, where the, a, a, the, 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 the prophetic word comes forth through prayer. That as you're praying, then, then you may be even to speak life into people because you're, 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 you're identifying with that person. You're in the Spirit praying. You're giving birth. 
And God may just speak just through you. Speak to you. So much of my praying I've learned, I pray God's word back to him. Know the word of God and pray it back to him. There's so much intercession in the word of God itself. Use it. He's there. Uh, this is one of the names of God. You know, hallowed be your name. Jehovah Shammah. Ezekiel 48. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. See, in faith, you know, go to that, that, that Hebrews chapter, chapter 1. When you pray in faith, and as someone who is interceding, And travailing. You, this is a very famous verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. I don't have to see it, Lord, to know you can do it. I love it. The assurance and the conviction. Faith is the assurance. I hope this will happen. Well, faith gives me that assurance that God's going to move. And I've got the conviction of things not seen. I wasn't there when Jesus rose from the dead. It was 2,000 years ago. I didn't see it. But I know it's true. Faith has given me that conviction even to die for that, but I didn't see it. But faith gives you the conviction of things unseen. Have I ever seen God in that sense? Of course not. God is spirit. But the conviction is so strong, I'll die for it. That's faith. It's the assurance of things hoped for. And sometimes if I ask people, and I do this many times just to get conversations going about eternity and, you know, um, what happens when you die? Well, I hope I'm going to heaven. Are you sure? No. Well, then that, that, that concerns me. Because faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I know I'm going, friends. Faith gives me the assurance of things hoped for. Our blessed hope is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the assurance he's coming back because faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So in my intercessions, I pray with assurance because faith gives me that assurance and that conviction of things unseen. Do I see things? No, I don't. The Holy Spirit convicting something? No. I may see manifestations of conviction, but God's working on human hearts in different ways, friends, that I don't have a clue. But I have a conviction of the things unseen as one who travails. I mean, now we have scans and, and monitors and stuff like that. But, you know, back in way before my time, in the old days when you didn't have that stuff, you just knew a baby was in your belly because you just knew it. And maybe you see maybe a leg on the, you know, on the, from the inside. You see, but you knew it. You saw some of the, you know, not the full thing there, but you saw it grow. And using the same metaphor, friends, we see that in people's lives. You know, that expression, he's, he's close to the kingdom. I'm sure we've all used that sometime. Because we've seen things, manifestations on the outside, but a conviction of what's going on on the inside. And as someone who travails, we pray with assurance. So faith is, is a realization. It's a legal deed that, that you know, you have a witness who brings a conviction, or the judge convicts. It's a confidence. Matter of fact, in my family, I have prosecuting attorneys in my family. Uh, my brother and, and my brother's partner. They're both prosecuting attorneys. We had a great talk before we left. We were just seeing, having dinner last night, or a drink, and they, were, and they were talking about the cases they've had. And I said, I would rather be a prosecuting attorney than a defense attorney. Why? Because a defense 
lawyer could know that their client is guilty as anything, but there they have to defend him to get him off. And that'd be hard for me to do, knowing. But a prosecuting attorney, because I, I, I even asked um, uh, my friend, my, 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 my brother's partner, I, said, I asked her, I said, you know, you know, have you ever done a case where you're pr prosecuting somebody and you really thought that he wasn't guilty? She said, never. I do it because I know I have evidence and I go after him as a state prosecutor. But that's, that's a conviction. I know. I have the evidence. We have evidence in the word of God that God can bring conviction. God can bring new life. And so I go at it with assurance. And they made us a negative thing about you know, prosecuting somebody, but in a sense of having that, 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 that conviction. I can go with, in my job as a child of God, as a prayer person with a conviction. God, I know you can touch this person. I know you can convict him unto life. Not to death, but to life. I know you can change the situation, Lord. I know you can bring revival in this land. I know you can fill my, you know, maybe it's a pastor, a, a youth leader, a music, you know, worship leader. So God, bring revival in the leadership of, of, of the church in this country. And this revival is going to happen, friends. I, I pray for pastors all the time. I pray for their wives. I pray for their family. I pray for leaders. Pray for the few that influence the many. That's why we are commanded to pray for our prime ministers and our presidents. Pray for the few that influence millions. I, I pray all the time, no matter who's in office, Lord, I pray for their cabinet members will be on their knees with the fear of God upon their lives. Bring revival in the cabinet. No matter who's there, I'm not talking politics, I'm talking spirit. Revival. God, bring it in our leaders. I pray for every magistrate who interprets the law. Let a fear of God come upon them as they interpret the law. There's a balanced scales, as Proverbs talks about, that's godly to God. Parliamentarians, when they pass bills, the godly laws will be passed. Put the fear of God upon them. And pray with assurance and their conviction. And the last thing, Show evidence of your faith. Speak faith. Walk it. Live it. Pray it. We are believing people, friends. Speak it. Live it. Know it. Again, you don't have to be obnoxious in your life and just blast everybody with scripture verses everywhere you go. I'm not talking that, man. I'm talking on the inside. Know that you're born again. Know that you're a possessor of the things of the Spirit. Know that you have authority, like I said before, to stand before the Lord like Abraham did. Same Spirit in him that's in you. Same one. There's one God, one faith, one baptism, one body. Speak it. Especially among ourselves, friends. Encourage each other. Ask the one next to you, pray for me. Let me pray for you. Walk it, live it, breathe it. And don't be tricked into a false humility of not speaking. Oh, God can't use me. God can't do that. I understand certain levels of, amen, so certain levels of oh, little old me, I can't. You know. Yes, little old you can tear down walls, man. The false humility of not speaking or telling and or especially using the gifts that you have because God wants to use you, every one of us. <clears throat> you know that, that, that parable of the mouse and the lion, right? Where the lion catches the mouse, he's about to eat it, yeah. And the mouse says, oh, please, Mr. Lion, I, I, could, I could probably, help, I could probably help, help you someday. And I goes, you help me, you're a mouse, I'm a lion. Uh, and the, the lion just laughs and because it's just the, the, the kick of it just throws the mouse away <clears throat> and didn't eat him. And the day later, the lion gets caught in the trap. 
He's, he's in a net. And here come the hunters. And here's the mouse. How you doing, Mr. Lion? <laughs> oh, come on, help me, man. How you doing? I'm just a mouse. Oh, come on, man, help me. Well, the lion climbs up the ropes and chews away the rope, and the lion gets it free. The little mouse. Don't be in this false humility. Oh, I'm just a mouse. You know, he, oh, this man, this woman of God, they're, they're lions. I'm just a mouse. No, man. Use, don't, don't be tricked into false humility. God can, will, and wants to use you. Everyone. You say, oh, my little toe is nothing. Try stubbing it one night in a dark night. The whole body is just going to its aid of that little toe. When one suffers, we all suffer. That's a different topic for a different time, but the point is, even the littlest part of the body, God knows. God has created. God can use. Speak the word, guys. Speak the word, and he'll be there. There's a poem. A friend of mine is a, is a poet. And she's a Christian, but that's where I get this thing. She, one of her poems, I even forgot what it was, but it never left me. And I, I read it, I've, I've even done kind of shows with it, with you know, poetic shows. And um, there's one phrase, speak the word and I'll be there. And it really hit me. And that, that was a prophetic word to me about God. And I, I, I did that show about 20 years ago and it's never left me. The Lord just says, God, Kurt, speak my word, I'll be there. My word's authoritative. Speak it. I'll be there. Speak it in faith. I'll be there. And that's true with everybody. Over your situations, over your children, you begin to travail. Speak the word of salvation over people's lives. Speak the word of freedom over people's lives. And that could even be in the quietness of your heart. It doesn't have to be boldly, you know, this proclamation. It could just be with authority praying over the situation. And speak in his word. He'll be there. And just one last thing here. Number five. What can assist me to obtain God's word in prayer? Travailing and intercession. Because that, that's what you're asking. I'm trying to find out things that maybe you would have a, a question to. Like, how, how can I get to this point we're talking about, Kurt? Well, start with a neutral ear. Good or bad, I don't mean evil, I mean bad, I mean things that I like doing or things I may not like doing, and receive it. Say, God, whatever you want me to do, have, have a neutral ear. Don't go with any presuppositions. I can do this, I can't do that. God, I'm here. Start with a neutral ear. Have divine desires. Seek first his kingdom. Again, we found out, you know, I mentioned this before. Find out what pleases the Lord. Not my will, God, your will. My desire is your desire, Lord. Have godly desires. Or I say here, divine desires for the alliteration, but have godly desires. Keep your heart pure and just say, you know, I just want to be available, God, whatever you want. Your will, not mine. Do some scriptural screening. In other words, test everything that you hear. That's the opposite, in a sense. Just don't believe everything that comes into your mind. Even, you know, good, and I'm not even talking about evil stuff, friends. Good is the worst enemy of best. I'm sure you've heard that expression. I may think of something really good to do, but God has the best thing to do. And I may grab onto the first good thing that comes along and miss the best thing that God wants to do in my life. You know, rest in what you hear. If it is God, friend, and you really believe it's of God, test it with other people, then go with it. Obey it. It's like a child who hears the word. Jesus even talks about that. A man had two sons, and you know, one's heard the father's command. He says, yes, yes, Dad, I'll do it. And went off and did whatever he wanted to do. The other son said, well, yeah, maybe God. Yeah, okay, maybe Dad, whatever. But went out and did it anyway. Which is more pleasing to the father? the one who obeyed. So maybe our initial attitude is, don't worry where you've come from. See where you are right now. 
is you've heard the word of the Lord in your heart, friends, and maybe many of you have. Obey it. Step out. Even to the point of stepping out of the boat. And we all know the, the, what I'm talking about. Peter stepped out of the boat. If that's you, Lord, call me out. He probably had no idea that Jesus would say, okay, come on out. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, my mates are with me, you know. So call me out, Lord. Come on out. I'm always, I'm always fascinated with that. Peter walked on water. Not just Jesus. Peter walked on water. He had that the rest of his life. I walked on water. Wow. Think what God has done in your life, friends. Again, have that goal of what you want God to do in your life. Scriptural screening. Hear the voice of the Lord, discern it, and obey it. Ask God for witness. That goes with number C or letter C. Ask God for the witness within and many times a confirmation without. Many times if I'm praying for something, and this has happened, I've heard other people say, and I knew it was the Lord through the other person, it's, it's time to give that up. There's a season for everything. And God, was, God wanted me to move on. I'm still doing certain things. And somebody come up and say, God, you know, Kurt, it's time to move on. Other times, there's a witness within. Or time to stay there. Many times, it's the witness, the confirmation without. is somebody saying, Kurt, press in. Keep going. And maybe tonight is a witness without for many of you here. I'm telling you, keep pressing. Keep pressing. And maybe you're getting a witness within with that. Be aware of his timing. God will tell you where and when. To everything there is a season and a purpose for everything under heaven. There is a time to plant and time to, and time to sow, a time to, to seek, a time to give up seeking. Ask God, God. Matter of fact, you can even ask before you leave tonight, God, what season is this in my, you know, am I in right now with you? And God will tell you through his word, through confirmation of the body, maybe through situations in your life. Let's just go to Mark 11. Jesus answered them, and this is my word to you, this is God's word today. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. 